Thank you so much. Hello again, everyone. I hope you were able to make some new connections and lounge and check out the latest innovation, innovations in tech at the exhibition. We are now joined by the fantastic Nicole Brown to explore clarity, excuse me, creating clarity in photo studio operations. Please make the most of her expertise and use the right hand panel to submit your questions at any point during the session or take part in the conversation with other attendees. And just a reminder, if for some reason you want to check out the uh, Festival of Creative Ops or Design Ops Symposium, which I highly recommend, but the session is gonna be amazing, scroll to the top of the agenda and click on the relevant tracks. Like I said, I know you'll wanna stay here with us and hear the wisdom Nicole has to share with us right now. Nicole, over to you. Hi everyone, uh, Claire, thank you so much for that lovely intro. Thank you to the Henry Stewart events. I'm very excited to be here today to share with you all some tips and best practices for creating clarity in photo studio operations. So as a photo studio operations professionals, creating clarity is nothing less than a superpower. And it's a, it's a very powerful tool. Um, that does all sorts of great things, like it promotes us gaining alignment, it um, builds and retrain, retains trust and credibility, it manages expectations, and it allows your organization to work smarter. So, um, you know, I think we all know, and I think we've talked about it quite a bit today, that these are uncertain times. We've never in uh, creative operations had expectations so high. We're in the midst of the great resignation and life itself just isn't very certain. We don't know if kids are going back to school, what to do with our pandemic rescue dogs who have separation anxiety. So now felt like a really good time to uh, put some focus on giving the gift of clarity to our teams, our stakeholders, our leaderships, and even ourselves. So uh, I'm about to jump into this presentation. I just wanted to make a note. I am gonna run through a lot of information here. I'm not gonna do a deep dive into one area, but as Claire said, please let me know in the Q&A if you'd like to spend more time on any one subject, happy to do that. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so let's jump in. Uh, let's talk about defining and documenting the current state. So when we talk about creating clarity, defining and documenting is, is a really powerful tool. So we're gonna talk about a few mechanisms or tools that can help us do that. I don't necessarily think that any of these are new concepts. However, I routinely encounter teams that either don't have this information or don't have this information updated. It might be you know, left on a wiki graveyard somewhere. And these tools can be really powerful, not only to have, but to continually utilize as an education tool. So let's talk a little bit about process, process maps and workflow diagrams. Um, so a lot can be learned from a quick review of a process map and workflow diagrams. These are really powerful tools, especially when you start adding information like where is your time in your process being spent? What technology tools are used in each step? Um, what roles are impacted in these steps. So this can be a really great way to visually give somebody a very quick review of how your process works. Um, I will say this is also a great place where we can see where external dependencies are or any risks that might be happening in your process. Um, again, process maps are nothing new, but my question would be how up to date are your process maps? Is that something you need to build time in for your teams to continually review? Uh, really, really powerful tools there. Uh, tooling diagram. So I don't know if you guys caught some of the other uh, presentations this morning. I'm sure you have, but tooling is on the top of mind for all of us. I know it is. And, you know, tooling is very dynamic. It's continually evolving and changing. So really having clear diagrams about, you know, your tools that you utilize in your studio, what integrates with other tools um, it is really helpful as you start to evolve. And I know you're evolving. Uh, I saw a great article in the Harvard Business Review, and it was titled, Productivity is About Your Systems, Not Your People. And I don't think that's ever been more relevant than in our creative spaces. So I know this is something, as operations professionals, we spend a lot of time uh, with tooling. Key performance indicators. So these are really, your KPIs are really uh, what defines the success or the health of your operation. And these should be really unique 
to, to your, your operation. So we have some usual suspects here. We have cost, we have quality, timeliness, team utilization. Those are common, but really what tells the story of your organization? So do you need a, let's say a compliance KPI? Do you need a partnership efficiency KPI? You know, back to your process map, if we see that you have dependencies in your process that are really going to impact the performance of your team, you may want to be able to pro provide your vendors or upstream partners with a metric that talks about their performance since it directly impacts your performance. Um, so it, when we talk about key performance indicators, I know it's not always easy to get at a complete set of data that tells the story of your operation, but I would encourage you all to define what the key performance indicators for your organization or, or your operation should be. And not only take it a step further and define the metrics that would make up those key performance indicators. So uh, what would you need to measure and show to, to tell you how you're performing and also to help you deep dive if you see something's off. Um, if we look at a timeliness metric, if you're missing your SLA by 50%, that really doesn't give you enough information to start making corrections or deep dive. What would likely be more impactful is if you could see what percentage of that am I missing by less than 24 hours and, and you know, however you want to bucket it so it's meaningful. But there's a big difference between missing an SLA by six hours versus missing an SLA by 14 days, right? So what information do you need to see in order to start making these the, uh, your reporting meaningful. And another thing about key performance indicators, when you identify what should be measured, what can be almost equally as helpful is helping the organization understand what shouldn't be measured and why. And I'll give you an example. I joined a team that was reporting some really basic metrics and one of them was around quality. And it was a wildly misleading metric because uh, the quality the intake mechanism they used would count a rejection. If, the, if one asset was rejected in the intake form, it would count however many assets were in that request. So it was really misleading. And I assure you, there is no organization out there that wants to see a misleading metric. So what we did instead is explain what the flaw was in that metric, what it should be to correctly report on that mechanism and what our path was to get there. So, you know, key performance indicators, I can't say uh, enough about the importance of even if you can't get at them, define for your organization what they should be. And lastly, uh, when we're talking about current state, RACI charts can be a really powerful tool. So for those of you unfamiliar with a RACI chart, it is a really simple matrix that, uh, that will clarify what individual or roles should either be responsible, accountable, communicated with, or informed for any task or set of tasks. And, you know, RACI charts, not only do they bring an incredible amount of clarity, if you don't have them, I guarantee you some great discussion will come from them, especially if you include upstream and downstream teams. Um, another thing, RACI charts, when you have them completed, can be a really great tool or mechanism to use when you are uh, building job descriptions. So you might see from your RACI chart, gosh, uh, a stylist on in our studio, it doesn't really fit the de definition of what is industry standard. So we wanna really clarify that, uh, set this role up for success in our job description. Um, if you do have RACI charts, periodically review them. Are they accurate? Do they reflect reality? Do they make sense? Do you see they're really heavy on certain roles or individuals and less so on others? Are the accountable parties the right people to be accountable for that task? And are they set up for success? Do they have the tools they need to be successful? So this is certainly not a complete list of tools or mechanisms that can help you define and document your current state. These are just a few. They might not be right for your organization depending on the size and complexity, but these are some really general tools that can be very powerful and um, 
I think that not only creating them, but keeping them up to date, continually refer referring to them when you're uh, working on prioritization, making um, business requests, planning, et cetera, they can become very powerful tools to keep your team aligned. Okay, so we are now going to move into talking about bringing some clarity to work in progress. So this is where really where we have a lot of balls up in the air. Communication and visibility is really key here to keeping everyone aligned. So I'm going to talk about a few mechanisms. Again, this is not a complete list, but just some suggestions of things you might want to start implementing if you haven't already. Um, prioritization process. I am sure that probably everyone viewing this has a formal prioritization process. Many of you are probably in agile environments. But what I wanted to touch on here is that it's equally as important to have prioritization process, not just for our core business, but for the projects we have, for our continuous improvement efforts. That might be a different audience, might be a different cadence, might be a completely different type of review, but remember that those should also be periodically reviewed. Um, if you are working on a project that is impacted by maybe you know, another team, uh, there's no point in you pushing or prioritizing that if it can't actually go into effect until that other team delivers. So really keeping on the same page with the rest of your org here can be really powerful. Uh, we'll talk about project charters. So for some of you, you may have dedicated uh, PM support, project management support, which is amazing. For those of you who don't, you or people you manage are likely unofficial project managers. And this is really where project or program charters can become your best friend. So a, pro a project charter will have all the relevant information about that project, the why, the how, the who, the when, the risk, everything. They're pretty intense to create, but this, when we talk about working smart, this is what we're talking about. Really front loading that effort in the planning and being very strategic. It's not only going to help increase the success of your project, it is huge for uh, saving time on communicating, alignment, um, and, and then it really comes down to just execution. I say that as if just execution is easy. It's not, but, but really front-loading that effort. These project charters are, are really powerful tools. Um, so let's talk about department updates. This is really basic, but a reminder, and I've been guilty of this in the past, really providing a, a regular cadence for updates on what your team is working on, links to where they can find more information. Um, this is a great place to communicate your prioritization pro, uh, process and when people can join if they have something to contribute. So just this might be where you want to um, share some information on KPIs, whatever is right. This really can help other teams to understand what your team is working on, how they're working on it. And, um, and, and it's also really great for your own team. Sometimes they don't always know exactly what's happening. And finally for work in progress, I would like to talk about change management. Uh, so, there's a number of quotes on intentions and none of them are very promising. A change management creates a lot of anxiety or, or excuse me, change in an organization creates a lot of anxiety. So as leaders in our studio operations, I really think it's time that we all stop thinking of as change management as a nice to have and think about it as a must have. And ways we can do that are perhaps focusing on dedicated change management roles. Um, it could be about looking at our technology solutions. How can we automate part of the change management process, right? Can we send uh, reminders when change are coming? Can we send trainings through mechanisms? So really ensuring that our teams have the tools they need to succeed as we are making all these great changes. Okay, so that was a bit about work in progress. Let's talk about um, future state, or as I like to say, better state. And really what I wanna talk about here is, is mainly planning. So some of the pitfalls that um, I see a lot of teams go through during, during planning. So we all know that data is critical when we are planning and planning could be your annual, annual yearly planning. It could be your continuous improvement efforts. It could be problem solving. Um, but data is always 
the key here on, on what on what you want to be looking at to to help teams understand the impact. Um, and I'll give you an example. If you are informed that in three weeks you are going to have unplanned volumes land in your studio and they need to be rushed. So perhaps your SLA is seven days and you're gonna have four days to execute it. Well, you have a beautiful process map. You know that there is 24 hours built in for the creative team to review and approve assets. So if you go to the creative team and say, I'd like to cut that. I, I need some time in this process for this rush request. I'd like to cut your review. They are likely not gonna be convinced that is the right move. That step is there for a reason. Now, imagine you had come to that same team, same scenario and said, we have this rush request coming in, as you're aware, we're looking to cut time. I reviewed the data and 98% of assets are approved on the first round. Of that 2% that are rejected, we did not see any customer facing issues. So we'd like to cut that step. How do you feel about it? You've probably just given your creative team the confidence they need to quickly say, I'm comfortable with us doing that for this batch of unplanned volumes. So again, you know, data is, is critical as you're working through all of your planning efforts. Um, so again, let's talk about a few challenges that can arise when we're dealing with data for planning. This might be the most common thing I see, missing data. So for instance, um, you have to turn in your 2022 yearly planning. However, the business has not verified 2022 volumes. So in this instance, really look for the information that you can find, right? And maybe you're lucky enough to have year over year information. Maybe you're looking at quarter over quarter. Um, you can create assumptions. Assumptions are okay. Just be very clear to define the logic you used. So an example of logic might be for 2022 volumes, we are uh, looking at the uh, growth between Q3 and Q4 of 2021, which was 10%. This is how you got at your number. If you do make assumptions, make sure to share them widely with your teams. Um, it, it can be really tough for leadership if all of their different teams are giving them different assumptions to align. So share that widely and, and you know, your teams may actually have some really great input that, that make you change your mind on what that logic should be. Okay, another thing I want to talk about, especially in these creative operations spaces, when we look at data, is remember to use your quantitative as well as your qualitative data, right? So I, I would say one is not more important than the other. And um, I'll give you an example of how we might use quantitative data and why it's so critical in our creative spaces. We are the educators, we are the bridge between creative and business. So really helping all of our teams understand that creative process often comes down to quantitative data. So let's just go back to that example that we see you are using vendors. I can see that from your process map that you have points where you're using vendors. Well, they highly impact your performance. So it stands to reason that you have criteria established for who you're hiring to ensure that they can meet the standards you need, right? So you might have some kind of a scorecard and that scorecard might look at some of those usual suspects. Are they coming in for the cost we negotiated? Are they coming in on time? Uh, let's talk about quality. You might have a rejection rate. So you might look to see some basic when, when you reject things and kick it back or how many rounds it takes to get right. But I doubt that's actually telling the full story of your vendor's creative quality. So what you could do in that case is get some quantitative data. And that might happen by making a very clear set of criteria based on your specific business. So you're not just looking for the best vendor, you're looking for the best vendor for your operation. So what is important to your operation and establishing clear criteria that you perhaps get your uh, creative teams to review on a set cadence that could be monthly, quarterly, so they are rating 
uh, your vendors. Now, why is this important? Well, if you continually see errors coming from your vendor, your natural, you naturally might say like, we're going to stop using that vendor. But if they are producing the highest creative quality, it might be worth it for you to spend some time with them, getting them to a place where, uh, where they get back on track, right? And, and this is why you might have to explain to the business of why you're spending time and resources to do that. So um, just don't forget about your quantitative data when you're planning and, and making your business cases. Okay, I'm gonna talk a bit on return on investment. This is something we're all working on all the time. It's critical to making a business case. It's critical to understanding how you prioritize projects and continuous improvement efforts. So uh, again, here, I'm gonna say, don't forget to use quantitative data as return on investment. So an example, let's say you have producers in your studio who are booking a high volume of freelance talent that likely comes with a high volume of invoices. Managing invoices is not necessarily a value add for a producer to be managing, right? So we would say if we looked in the producer's process map, we would have identified that as a non-value add step. Very important to the business, very important that our freelancers are paid, but not a value add that it doesn't take production expertise, right? So you may look at automating that function. You may look at streamlining the invoicing of your producers to a dedicated procurement role, which is likely going to give you efficiencies. But as well, you're gonna capture all those efficiencies. You're also gonna to wanna to talk, you're gonna to wanna to talk about employee satisfaction, how much happier your producers are when they can focus on producing. Um, so, Again, with your return, anytime you're making a business case and you're identifying return on investment, use your tools, whatever set of tools you have, whether it be process maps, whether it be racy charts, what, you know, whatever the case tooling diagrams, use them. Um, they're going to help you make very fast, they're going to help you work smart. You're going to be able to make decisions much faster. You are not going to experience analysis paralysis. You're going to be able to quickly get at meaningful information. And I'd like to share an example here with you that I think reflects that. Um, uh, so I was on a team and we were building uh, a custom technology solution. It was a huge project, it was expensive, and it was time consuming. And as we went along, we uh, had a scope discovery situation where our consultants were suggesting that we include a feature that we had planned on uh, including in phase two, not in our minimum viable product. It added significant cost and some time to the project. That at that moment, I needed clarification that this was the right decision before before I went to leadership. So my team and I were able to very quickly, which was good because we didn't have much time, use our mechanisms to identify exactly what would change in our process, what roles would be impacted and what the return on investment would be. Um, we used our tooling diagrams to say we are no longer going to have to do this down the line. It actually saves us money doing this right now. So this was in the appendix of our business case. And I highlight this one to not only show you how quickly that these tools can help you get to the right decisions, but also to talk about the confidence it gave me knowing that I was going in with a very clear recommendation. And uh, that confidence I was bringing to my leadership to look at that document, clearly see that we had looked at this every which way. And now, instead of deciding whether this was the right or the wrong decision, we were focused on getting the budget, right? So it really put the conversation and the effort where it needed to be. And I also note here, if you ever work with consultants, they are masterfully using these type of tools to educate their clients and keep their projects on track. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about current state, work in progress, and future state. I'd like to jump forward and talk a little bit about leading by example. So this is really focusing on our um, management of people 
And so I, I'm going to touch on meeting efficiency um, since we're so many of us are working from home. I'm not going to talk about how to run an efficient meeting. You know how to do that. But what I am going to say is be respectful of people's time. Start and end meetings on time. You may be very casual and that works for you, but that may not be working for a lot of the people on the call. Yes, starting and ending your meetings on time is efficient, but much more importantly, it builds trust. Um, time is something none of us have right now. And, and, and if you don't respect time, people aren't going to be so keen on giving you time. So really respect your meeting, your meeting times. Um, respecting the mechanisms. So we talk about mechanisms a lot in here. So whatever mechanisms you are using, you are asking your teams to keep updated. You are asking them to understand them, respect them, meaning uh, use them and refer to them often, right? This is a great tool for keeping everybody on track. So I want to tell you a story about a director I had who was excellent at respecting the mechanisms. Whenever my or anyone on my team sent a project charter out that had a task that newly became off track, by the end of the day, I would see an email from the director to the manager of the person or team responsible for the task with me in CC. And it simply said, how can I help get this task back on track? Or how can I help your team get this task back on track? Because she prioritized the mechanisms and accountability, so did everyone else. And I assume she did that for everyone in the org. So that's a really great example of how you can respect the mechanisms that are helping your job be easier and your team's job. Uh, shout out to Harmony Long there. Thanks, Harmony, for the great example. Okay, having the tough conversations. So I think we all know that tough conversations cannot be avoided, but these tools, these mechanisms are really going to be the tools you need to help educate and to help coach your teams or your business partners about why you're making the decisions. And this becomes even more critical as creative operations gets more and more demanding. We do have to be very clear about what we will do and what we won't do and why. And we have to continually explain this and stay true to our vision, or we won't actually get any of these big initiatives done if we're saying yes to everything. So these mechanisms can really help you and they're excellent coaching mechanisms for managing your team. And finally, I wanna talk about aligning your team. So you, you use mechanisms, you are very clear on what your vision is, um, it's not enough that you're clear, your teams need to be clear. So they need to understand why decisions are being made. When we talk about prioritization processes, as many of your team members that you can get in those meetings is really powerful for them to understand and have a voice in what is happening and why. So, you know, they are ambassadors for your creative operation spend the time getting your team there, right? So you have a lot of mechanisms that can really help you, again, getting your team there. Um, highly recommend you do that. So again, thank you to everyone for your time. I really hope that you found this helpful and that these are some tools you can take back and start utilizing in your creative operation space immediately. And I hope it served as a reminder for all of us to be the very clear, thoughtful leaders that I know we are. So thank you, everyone. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, um, amazing insights and advice. All right. So we are a little tight on time. So if you want to continue the conversation with Nicole, please join her in the lounge. She'll be heading over there right after we wrap up. And luckily, it's not a long walk. Ha -ha. Um, <laughs> and next up, we are excited to welcome our expert panelists who will be participating in live discussion and taking your questions. Join us again in about five minutes to explore growth, agility, and flexibility, the photo studio of tomorrow. See you there. Thanks again, Nicole. Thank you.